Well, good morning again. How are we? If you have your Bibles, I want to invite you to turn with me to the book of Second Peter. Um, we'll be in chapter number 3. We're going to focus our thoughts primarily in verse number 9 this morning. But before we, before we get into uh, the message this morning, I want to ask the church to remember that next week we have a very special Sunday uh, planned here. Brother John Hansen and Vanessa and family are going to be here. John, are you around? Let me, where, where are you at? About, up here in the top. Um, they're in town this week for a wedding, if I remember correctly. And uh, they're going to be back with us next week. Um, the church has been praying and looking for someone who can come and join us on staff and help us, not only with our youth, but our families. And uh, we are going to be hearing from him next week, and we are going to be praying about that, and we are going to be praying that uh, God's will is done. Um, most of you know John and, and Vanessa from years gone by. Um, we've heard a lot of good things about them, and we, we believe God is working and moving, but I want you to continue to pray for that, and as we, as we come together and, and we vote next week, well, just let the Lord lead and guide in that, if you would, okay? Also, there's another gentleman here this morning that is very special to me, and I want to recognize him. Brother Richard McCormick is with us today. Um, Brother Richard is one of those guys, he's kind of like a father to me. Now, he may not want to admit that, but in the ministry, he's, he's been a great encouragement to me over the years and a blessing to me, and it's good to see him and his lovely wife here today. And hope when you leave, you can say it's been good to see us too, okay? Okay. As we... As we focus our thoughts on the epistle of Second Peter, and what we're going to be talking about today is uh, God's long suffering towards us. We are observing the communion table in just a few short minutes, and that communion table is a meal that is to remind us of the sacrifice that was paid for our sins and for our salvation. When we think about the bread, it represents the body of the Lord Jesus Christ that was beaten and broken. And we, when we partake of the fruit of the vine, it reminds us of that blood that was shed there on Calvary, and it is that blood that cleanses us and washes us from our sins and makes us acceptable to our holy and heavenly Father when we put our faith and trust in Him. Now I want to say that I believe with all my heart that not only Peter, but I believe Paul and the apostles were all looking for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ in their lifetime. Paul speaks in, in, in the book of Thessalonians and, and implies that he is anticipating that he'll be one of those that will be caught up in the rapture of the church or the, or the catching away. Uh, Peter, I believe, was looking for it and the others were looking for it. And yet over 2,000 years now has passed and Jesus still has not when you go to the book of Timothy and when you look not only in Peter but Paul talks about it in multiple places how that in the last days perilous times are going to come that people are going to turn from the faith that scoffers will come into play and that's exactly what Peter is talking about here in 2 Peter chapter number 3 if you pick up in verse number 3 it says knowing this first that there shall come in the last days scoffers and really what that, mean, that word means is mockers saying where is the promise of his coming now, we live in a day and age where we have been in anticipation of the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I just want to go on record this morning and say very clearly, I believe that Jesus Christ is coming again. As a matter of fact, I believe the rapture of the church is the next big event on God's calendar and in regards to prophecy. I believe that Jesus Christ is coming again. Here's the reality, though, whether he will not come according to my time schedule or what I think is right, but he will come at the time the Father has appointed. And in Peter's day, there were those that were scoffing and mocking because everyone was looking for his return. And they began to say, he promised it, all these years have passed, and nothing has happened. And if you follow on there and you read in that passage of Scripture, and you look farther on down, 
Peter begins to explain a couple of events that took place where God intervened in the course of nature. Now, I want you to also to understand with me, and we can get into a thought theological debate a little bit later on, but I'm one of those guys that believe Jesus created the heavens and the earth in six literal days. I don't have a problem believing that. If he can call this earth into, into existence out of nothing, he can create it. And let me just throw a, 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 another sidebar out. If he can create this world, he can create it with the appearance of age as well. I don't have a problem with that. Let me just remind you, when Adam was created, he wasn't created as a little baby. He was created as a man. Okay? I believe that God created the heavens and the earth. I believe when Genesis, Genesis says he's spoken into existence, that's exactly how it came to play. And in six days, we have this world and this universe and all that God created. What Peter is arguing here with those scoffers is, how did the world come into existence? God spoke, and it was so. Their argument was, well, since the beginning of time, things have gone on, nothing has changed, the laws of nature have taken control. So he reminded them of another event that took place in the days of Noah when the flood came and destroyed those non-believers, and only Noah and his family were saved because they put their faith and trust in God. Peter is telling them, just as God intervened and brought judgment in the days of Noah, there is a day coming when he is going to intervene and bring judgment. Next time, it will not be by a flood. It will be by fire, but judgment is coming. What you and I need to remember is that one of these days when this life is over and at that appointed time when Jesus sits on the throne, we are going to stand before him. We are going to be held accountable for what we've done in this life. And I can tell you, when we stand before Him, there is only one thing that is sufficient for Him to look at us and say, well done, enter in, and that's the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The truth of the matter is, none of us deserve heaven. None of us deserve forgiveness. None of us deserve salvation. But God, because of His great love for us, in the, in, before the foundations of the world came up with a plan and the plan was to send the very best that he had his only begotten son to this earth to take my place on the cross so that when I put my faith in him that blood can cleanse me and make me whole the meal that we're going to be observing today is in remembrance of that great sacrifice what he did for me and what he did for you and what he's done so that whoever so will call upon his name can be saved. The, the price that was paid is sufficient so that anyone can come to a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Look with me in verse number 9, if you would, where the scoffers were saying, time has passed, nothing's changed. When Peter speaks to him, he says, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise. You know, I, I don't know about you. Anyone here, have ever, someone ever make you a promise and they failed to, to fulfill it? Why well, are you all looking at me? Did I fail something? I, I'm just, you know, m mankind, we make promises, and then things will change, and, and sometimes we'll, we'll do what we said, and sometimes we won't. There are some times when promises are made that we just do not have the power and the ability to fulfill. We, we kind of get... get you know, the cart in front of the horse, and we make a promise that, that we have no control over. What Peter is saying here is, God is not slack. He doesn't tarry on his promises. There is a purpose and a reason why Jesus Christ has not yet come. And it's not because he lost his power. It's not because somebody has intervened or somehow he, he, has, he has failed to, to keep what he said he would do. It is because of, if you'll notice, he is long-suffering to usward. Now, think about that. Why isn't Jesus coming? Because he is a merciful God. I, John 3, 16, God so loved that he gave. Why did he give? So that whosoever would believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. What is God's desire for each and every one? that the Holy Spirit would be able to, to, to enlighten their mind, open their eyes in a spiritual sense, that they could see their need and reach out and embrace Jesus Christ. And whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. 
Jesus Christ came so that the world could be forgiven their sins and that heaven could be their home. When he says he's long-suffering to, to us, we're not willing that any should perish. Folks, I'm just going to try to say it as simply as I can. There are all kinds of religious philosophies and ideas out here. But the Bible teaches that after this life is over, there are two destinations. Now you say, Brother Allen, that's, that's not popular. That's, 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 not, that's not a good thing to say. If it's in the Word of God, it's a good thing to say. When this life is over, there are two options. In heaven, in the presence of Almighty God, or in the lake of fire because we've rejected the sacrifice that was given for our benefit. Now, we can try to duck that. We can try to hide it. We can try to turn away from it. We can close our eyes to it. But the reality is, is there is a day coming when we will stand before God and our destination is going to be determined on not whether I've been a good person or a bad person. My destination is based on whether or not I have accepted the gift that God provided for me. And when Peter's talking here and he says he's not slack concerning his promises, some men count slackness, but he's long-suffering to us. We're not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Let me just say this to you this morning. God has done everything that needs to be done for us to spend eternity in his presence. Sin must be paid for. Do you believe that? Sin must be paid for. Jesus Christ came and paid the penalty for those that put their faith and trust in him. And as we stop and consider here this morning the gift that was given, let me just say this. God's desire, is ever, will everyone be saved? Absolutely not. But if, if people come to him and the Holy Spirit explains them or shows them their need and they put their faith and trust in him i can tell you by based on the authority of the word of god they will be saved god's desire is for everyone to be saved jesus came so that whosoever will could believe in him jesus paid the penalty and that blood is sufficient to cleanse us from our sin regardless of who we are or what we're doing or what what we what we've been doing or, or what's going on his blood is sufficient but understand me salvation is through the blood of jesus christ the greatest example of love that has ever been given is when jesus christ went to that cross endured all the humiliation and all the shame all the suffering and all the pain and he hung there and cried out my God my God why hast thou forsaken me aren't you glad he also said father forgive them they know not what they do that price that was paid was for me it was for you and if you've not accepted him as your Lord and Savior here this morning, I want you to know he's a prayer away. You put your faith and trust in him. You acknowledge him to be the promised one. You confess your sins and ask him to forgive your sins. I can tell you from firsthand experience, he will hear that prayer and he will cleanse you and make you Church, this is the message that we're supposed to share with a lost and dying world. That God loves them. That God wants them to spend eternity in his presence. That God has paid the penalty and paid the price so that could happen. And they need simply to accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And salvation can be theirs. Sometimes I wonder if we had the opportunity for God to just roll back the lid and give us a brief glimpse of what hell is really like. I wonder if it would motivate us. 
to be more focused on our mission. Heaven awaits those that have put their faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. And those that reject him will be sentenced to the lake of fire. The good news is we don't have to go there. Jesus paid the penalty. I'm going to ask you to stand for just a moment if you would. We're going to sing one verse of invitation this morning. And what we would like for you to do is to be in prayer. If you have never put your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, let me say once again, God loves you. And Jesus paid the penalty for you. And if you will simply come, confess him as Lord and Savior, and turn from your sins, salvation can be yours. It's not about what we do about what he did for us it's about that shed blood it's about that broken body and it's about his great love 